Hi everyone in Cloud Computing and welcome to episode 56 of the Cloud Computing Australia show featured on YouTube and podcast with Brad Nelson and the world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, Cloud Computing Recruitment Specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, fintech and AI. In this week's show we are talking about the Australian healthcare has previously been one of the industries hesitant to shift to the cloud. Hi Dave, it's great to have you back on the Australia show this week. Yeah, it's great to be back, and this is a great topic because this kind of reflects uh, the way the cloud's being adopted in every healthcare system all over the world. Yeah, it truly is, and it's had its ups and downs, hasn't it? So, uh, you yeah, know, look, opening question, I guess. Is it time for the Australians to push healthcare quickly into the cloud? Yeah, I think so. It looks like uh, you guys are going to regulate the heck out of the, the industry coming in as you're pushing any kind of automated automated. Uh, um, electronic medical records and the ability to kind of uh, automate the billing systems and the insurance uh, systems and even uh, uh, some of the uh, um, single payer stuff that you have in Australia and some they have in the other countries. And so with that kind of change coming forward, you need to really kind of build an infrastructure that's able to change. And that's typically going to be a cloud. And, and we're not pushing everything to cloud and, you know, we're not telling everybody you have to force March to cloud. But if you're getting to a point where you're going to change your databases to special purpose databases, you're going to get into different security models. You're going to have to live up uh, to these uh, 220, uh, what was it, 22,600 pages of combined state and federal legislation across uh, three, 305 different acts of parliament covering the health sector. Oh, my God. Uh, I mean, who's going to keep up with that? You're going to have to have lawyers to, to watch the lawyers to, uh, to get those things done. Um, you might as well just kind of set it up so you're going to have to basically bend around all this craziness and all these different legislative things and all these different legal issues that are coming forward. Healthcare is the mother of all, uh, all uh, restrictions and regulations. And I, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but here in the States, if you violate them, you could easily go to prison. I mean, they, it's really that strict. And, uh, you know, I used to sell HIPAA-based uh, data integration stuff, you know, back in the late 90s when I was CTO of Mercator. And kind of one of the ongoing jokes, if you don't buy my product, you're going to jail. And that's that's kind of, the, you know, that's kind of the way it was. And I heard that from my clients all the time. And so we're in a state where we're getting into the pressure of the regulations that are coming down upon us. And we're trying to figure out the right technology to make it. I don't think you're going to be able to come up with one single solution. I think it's a matter of coming up with a platform that's completely changeable, an architecture that's changeable. And, and guess what? That lives in the cloud. Yeah, the cloud's a powerful thing, and you're right. I mean, look, everything is shifting that way because of the, the accessibility of, of so many different departments and the, the joined-up thinking. I think there's been, from what I've read on this, and, and, and it, it's being embraced by a lot, but obviously you know, there's a lot of people who've arched backs on this as well because of the potential intrusive nature of certain practitioners being able to see certain things where they had no access before. And I think that's a, you know, there are concerns around that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and that's going to be that's going to continue to be a concern. And but it's not really technology that causes those problems. It's people who are making either huge mistakes, but most of the time it's uh, uh, you know shenanigans and uh, and things that that are that are occurring that shouldn't be occurring. So the fact of the matter is is that you can make all the laws you'd like uh, in terms of privacy, and we have those in the states as well, and they have those in Europe and certainly in the UK. However, the ability for the companies to kind of keep up with the technology and put the right security parameters around that really kind of is the, is the bridge too far for many of these organizations that don't have a lot of money. Uh, one of the things that kind of strikes me about healthcare, it's a hugely profitable sector of the economy, and, and but they seem to suffer the most budget uh, shortfalls of, within, within IT than any other sector that I kind of work in, and which means that they're not able to succeed as well as they should just because they don't have the resources. My guidance to them, you're going to have to invest in the resources to get things to a point where the risk lowers that all these things aren't going to happen. Or you will have laptops stolen out of, this is stuff we have in the States, laptops stolen out of cars with, you know, personally identifiable information and medical record information on them, you know, chips stolen and you know, things misdirected and, uh, you know, huge databases sent out via email or carried out of the place on a, on a USB drive. Uh, so you're going to have to get very good at IT, which gets you very good at security, 
and very good at the right enabling technology. And that means migrating to different platforms they have right now. These folks are on these old proprietary systems, MUMPS databases, things like that, which is systemic in the healthcare world. It's time to start modernizing those things. And you're going to have to pay to make that happen. And so you're not going to be able to reduce your risk and eliminate these privacy issues unless, number one, you have a lot of training that goes on to make sure that uh, none of this stuff goes down because people are smart. And number two, you're going to have the right technology in place to allow them to solve the problems. And that takes money. So it really kind of comes down to probably an increase in the budgets over the next five years of 50%. And that's something that's a you know, a very jarring thing for people who are running hospitals and healthcare organizations. Yeah, it truly is. Uh, you know, you've hit on some really interesting points there. And look, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not the technology's fault that, you know, things get um, uh, mislaid or, or it, it, more often than not, we always find this. It's human error that leave the buckets open. It's, it's human error that, that caused these problems of just being, you know, leaving things around and, and where they shouldn't or, or left open or unlocked or unsecure. Uh, it's just it's a shame, really, because in in an ideal world, you'd like to think that pushing a healthcare system or or at least some sort of a patient patient information to the cloud that's accessible by the people that need to do it will enable people to you know engage with their interconnected health devices that will push data. So if there is a a health an ongoing health concern where people you know need to be you know um, updated, so they live in a rural area for argument's sake and. And they kind of rely on this interconnected device to upload to the cloud so a practitioner can keep an eye on them in a, in a remote way. You know, It's just a shame, isn't it, that, that there are so many people out there that, that sort of mistreat this, this technology. Yeah, it is. And it's just a matter of protecting the technology from the people who are going to mistreat the technology, technology. And that's becoming very good at security and governance and things like that and monitoring and management. So the jumping off point to this is not necessarily to remove, um, you know, the stupid and evil people from the equation. It's about protecting the, the technology and protecting the data from the people. And you do that with layers and layers of security that's well thought out. Um, data is anonymized. You're not, you know, putting PII information with, with medical record information together in the same database. So you really can't tell what's what, even if you see the data. You know, everything's encrypted on, on the fly and at rest. And I think going forward, we're going to have to have those sorts of practices that are in place um, that really kind of locks things down and gets very good at, at creating these security systems where we have access to information we need to see. And pretty much everything that's in our health history, you know, I should be able to, you know, turn it over to Fitbit or have Fitbit connect to it in, in some sort of a secure way. And maybe they don't, they can't see it because it's encrypted. And I think that's absolutely fine. But the thing is, my health data is useful because, number one, I can figure out patterns that are leading up to preventative diseases and preventative causes so I can increase the, my lifespan just by kind of making good decisions based on the information that's there. And I think ultimately this is something that the healthcare industry needs to figure out. And they have to understand that technology is their friend. Their ability to kind of leverage this technology in a, in a way, typically leveraging cloud-based systems, identity access management, encryption-based systems, uh, electronic medical record things, and the ability to anonymize information, the potential to leverage that data for good is probably 20 times that in the healthcare world than it is in the finance world, and the retail world, things like that. It can actually affect our health and to a, in a very easy way, just by changing a few things, just by basically getting knowledge to our physicians and knowledge to us, um, it really kind of kind of changed our lives. And I don't think people look at it that way. They, they kind of look at it as risk. They look at it as preventative medicine, defensive medicine, uh, liability issues, you know, things like that. And they don't look at the potential for this. Some doctors do and some physicians do and some data scientists do, but we're not considering this enough and not being innovative enough in the space to understand about the security issue, which you just raised, was absolutely abhorrent, and they're going to have to basically fix that. But the ability to leverage this information in ways that we thought we couldn't leverage it in the past, and I think that's what we need to be looking at right now. We really do. We really do. Uh, so, so right. So, look, you know, there's some figures around this, and I think there's 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 an apprehension from a public point of view of jumping on board. Uh, the Australian uh, My Health record or my health record i think it's called uh, my health record is a uh, almost identical framework to the one that was in the used in the uk uh, which was actually scrapped in the end because the company uh, my care 
dot, I don't know what they were called now. <laughs> so I won't even mention the URL, but they were scrapped because basically they were doing a similar thing and they sold all the data to pharmaceutical companies and, and, and off to various other uh, organisations, insurance companies, health insurance, companies, which is diabolical, absolutely. And, and so the figures around Australia, I think, you know, there's a bit of scaremongery there because people, you know, obviously that case is being related directly to Australia due to the fact that it's almost the identical framework. Um, about 6 million people have already uh, got their records online. Uh, I know that 1.15, 1.15, 1.15 million have decided to opt out so far, uh, and, and about 300,000 have opted in. And I believe there's 17 million people that are expected to automatically be enrolled, which is uh, by the deadline, which is the 31st of January. So, you know, some some really interesting figures there, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, my, my advice to them is, uh, you know, don't screw it up. I mean, don't sell the data, don't, you know, put the security in there, things like that. The only way you're going to win confidence of the um, uh, Australian citizens is the ability to be really good with the information and make it useful for them. So people who who opt in are basically those who are going to be, um, you know, given access to information that others can't see. They're combining information, things like that. Things are going to be helpful to them. And as time goes on and people see successes there, more and more people are going to opt in. And I, I think that's the way they have to look at it. I mean, these risks are always going to be there. And the reality is there your data is someplace now and who's ever holding your data can always sell it. Um, so then maybe uh, regulations and legislation, legal issues around that, and they should be you know, t taken care of. But once it gets in a central location, you can also have centralized trust and you can kind of place a security veil around that stuff, which is actually an iron curtain. So we have the information in the same place and basically holding the records uh, under the same sort of security schemes. That means, you know, we that we still do BCDR and back it up and replicate things like that. But, you know, don't screw it up. I mean, the thing is people have confidence in these systems that can be weighed, uh, can be tossed aside in uh, one breach. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I would lose sleep at night where I running those systems, but also I would put enough money and talent and technology in the place where it absolutely would be impossible for that stuff to happen or near impossible. And that's what they need to do. Yeah, they, they really do. The security, as you said, the back end is, is the foremost. It's very interesting who actually has access to their personal data uh, from a user point of view. So, I mean, it's not we're not just talking about the back end security. We're talking about the accessibility and what's available to people. So your obviously your doctor can access it. Your pharmacist can access it, your physiotherapist, your nurse, diagnostic imaging and pathology practice, um, and, and other unidentified staff will be able to see your record. So slightly concerning around that, but also the following can see the record. The chiropractor, osteopath, dentist, psychologist, Chinese medical practitioner. So anyone that's registered with the Australian Health Practitioner regulation agency will be able to see all of the information so it's it's just amazing isn't it yeah it is amazing and hopefully they're looking at uh, the concept of meaningful use and so they're showing only the information that's needed by the practitioner obviously the you know psychologist or the site uh, if you're seeing a psychologist which you know can't prescribe medicine you know doesn't need to see your blood work and uh, you know any kind of diagnosed diseases and things like that but the reality is all those people need access to the information and so and that's provide you with better care and also the ability to have them access it directly versus you carrying the records into the building which typically are going to be lost or you know the old um, filing cabinets which used to roll across the floor that most doctor's office has that's where that stuff was stored and that was stuff you know, could be breached all the time, that information absconded, you know, much more easier than it is in those systems. So start thinking about who's leveraging it, how they're using it, um, you know, different ways in which you can have a granularity around the security systems, things like that. But I'd rather have the information out there and accessible to the people who need it and are authorized to see it and sharing the information uh, than the information not being accessible. And it's also great, you know, to have you know, my health information online. I mean, I have a portal that, you know, my doctor uses and I, I take blood tests and I see the information out there, review it, and I can discuss things with him electronically. And, and that's all, uh, you know, much better than, you know, him calling me into the office and uh, asking me, you know, this always scares the hell out of me, you know, then in, in telling me we need to uh, get my cholesterol down two points or something like that. And so that's, it's fine by me. The more we can automate this process and take the, the, the weight states out of it, uh, I'm better for it. And the more information that's in the hands of people who can actually save my life and better my health, I'm all for it. And I can figure out the technology and the security. 
Yeah, very true. Well, look, it moves us on nicely to your, your top three tips if we haven't already covered them at some point in this show, Dave. Yeah, number one, regulation leads the day. We just talked about the you know almost over regulation to a comical point of uh, almost every country in the in the world, uh, whether it's China, the United States, Europe, and that's because really people look at the medical records and medical information as probably the most personal and private information that's out there that we can have, and they want to make sure that it only falls into the right hands. So you need to understand the regulations before you start building these systems and migrating into the cloud. I find there's a real gap between what the reality is and then what people are are actually doing uh, and probably overstating the regulations, not understanding the details behind it, not understanding the levels of encryption, not understanding how much money they need to uh, you know, pay to get these systems in place. So do that first before you do anything. Focus on security and governance, as we just talked about that for most of the conversation that we had, because that's everything in the medical world. But security and governance, <clears throat> governance need to work together. And so the ability to make sure that you know, uh, a, nurse a nurse practitioner has access to information that's probably different than a nurse and different than a, uh, a, my uh, physician and different than uh, the um, uh, pharmacist you know, down the hall. You know, who doesn't need to see everything about you. And you need to have governance and guardrails around the information, keeping everybody get in their little lanes as to what their roles are and how they're playing in the process. And then don't be afraid of the technology. I really find, I find the healthcare world is scared to death about technology because of liability and risk. And because if they're breached, you know, to, to mention you had that, that uh, you know, um, all that shenanigans on that, that went on in the UK, if they're breached, it's gonna be a huge issue. Uh, and that's going to basically kill uh, that organization typically. So however, technology is your friend, your ability to leverage technology in an effective way will remove that risk versus adding that risk. And you should kind of look at it that way. Great top tips there, Dave, thanks so much. You got it. And uh, you know, thanks for being part of the Australian show this week. It's been a great show, long show as well, nearly 20 minutes long. It's always a pleasure. Well, it's a good topic. We're going to keep the Australians healthy. <laughs> exactly. And thanks for watching, everyone. We really hope you enjoyed watching this week's show. You can get Dave on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. I'm on Twitter, at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Uh, we're obviously on all of the social media, so come and check us out. Come be part of the, the crew. Uh, all the links are below in the description box. Also, the links to our blogs, our latest blogs that, that David writes exclusively for us. There's a link there in the description box below. You can catch us on iTunes and Stitcher as podcasts as well. So when you're on the go, you can listen to us. Uh, and yeah, remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share uh, this channel with your friends and with your colleagues. Uh, we really love the support that we're getting online. And yeah, it means a lot to us uh, to know we're getting some great feedback on what we're doing at the moment. So yeah, thanks for watching and until next week.